You're experiencing sleep paralysis. This has been your YC Weekly, and I'm your host, Seth Cerrante. I'm your host, Claudia Paguay. My name's Natalie. With the host, me, Deja. Hi, I'm Jonah. I'm one of the interns here at Eminem. The National Action Network kicked off April 2019 by hosting a free conference available to the public at the Times Square Sheraton Hotel. The conference offered panel discussions and workshops that dealt with intersectional topics such as gun violence and mass incarceration. Many of these talks were led by prominent members of the African American community and featured the voices of distinguished panelists such as Senator Brian Benjamin, Public Advocate Jumani Williams, District Attorney Darcel Clark, and Reverend Stephen Green. I just have three letters for you. The NRA, the yeah, National yeah, yeah, Rifle yeah. Association, has a bottleneck on our federal government. Why do they have a bottleneck on our federal government? Because of who's in charge. We've got Trump in the White House, we have Republicans controlling the Senate, and for a while, the Republicans have been controlling the, uh, the, the, the House of Representatives. If we want to deal with this issue, we have got to get the right people federally in the office. Hi all, you're watching the Youth Media Channel and today we're taking you on a special trip to the Bronx. Come on. Men, women, police officers and children gathered at the Kipps Bay Boys and Girls Club to play basketball and socialize at the second annual Community Hoops event organized by Race for Reentry. The nonprofit organization is a collaborative effort in order to raise awareness and provide solutions for communities impacted by incarceration. Here's Charles Simmons, a community activist and referee for the day's games. Um, it's a lot of things that we do in the community to give back to the community, um, and today's just a fun day. That game's was going great, you know, we had the, um, the NYPD play against the community hoops, and now we got the wheelchair playing against the MP MPD. The wheelchair basketball team, the Brooklyn Nets, also took home a victory against the 43rd Precinct, with Ernell Samuels as a forward and a star shooter. He's been on the team for a few years and also sees a change in his relationship to other members. It's been fun. Uh, it's been a rough road. We started off real bad, but we've been getting better and better over time. A lot of, a lot of growing pains, a lot of learning each other and each other's games. It's one conflict that y'all really grew through that stuck out to you, that you were like, oh wow, we're a team now. Lack of communication. We communicate a lot now. We talk to each other on and off the court. We hang out more of a family-wise. Welcome to the YC Filler. I'm your host, Seth Serrate. Did you know that New York City has a pair of twin parks? That's right, there are two high bridge parks. Each are separated by the East River and both are named after the oldest standing bridge in the city, the High Bridge. Manhattan's High Bridge Park is the larger of the two by a wide margin, spanning 119 acres. It houses the High Bridge Recreation Center and a pool for an operation as early as 1936, as well as a skate park and the High Bridge Water Tower. The water tower has been here since 1872. It was built here to increase the water pressure that was needed for the city. While the park was built between 1867 and the 1960s, most of the land was acquired between 1895 and 1901 through condemnation. The southern half is maintained by the city's Parks Department, which is currently using High Bridge as a testing ground for their pilot smart benches, part of the Smarter Parks Initiative, which seeks to improve parks through the use of technology. They even have these solar power charging stations where you could charge your phone. You could just plug your 
USB cord into there and then you could charge any device and then have a fully charged phone while exploring the park. Dividing the northern and southern half of the park is the High Ridge Water Tower. The octagonal tower was assembled in pieces from 1866 through 1872 to meet the city's growing demands on the water system. Its construction was accompanied by a seven acre reservoir and stands at the Manhattan end of High Bridge. The bridge was built in the mid 19th century and took 11 years to construct. When crossing the bridge, you'll be walking right above the original aqueduct pipe, right underneath us. It was part of the Croton aqueduct system, used to carry water from the Westchester County. After the major Deegan Expressways and the Harlem River Drive's construction in 1956, the public use of the bridge faded. The river became polluted and public access discontinued in the 1960s. Over four decades later, in 2015, the High Bridge was reopened to the public and remains a picturesque landmark location for Bronx and Manhattanites. So the next time you're up in the Heights, or High Bridge, make your way to one of the most underrated views of the city. This has been your YC Filler. Thanks for watching. Until next time, I'm your host, Seth Serrata. Most of us have heard of Harlem, the Upper East Side, Kipps Bay, I could go on and on. But have you ever heard of Minahanuk? No? How about Hogs Island? That either? Blackwell's Island ring a bell? Welfare Island? These are the past names of what we now call Roosevelt Island, Manhattan Island's kid sibling. Roosevelt Island is tiny, running 2 miles long and 800 feet wide. That's roughly the same distance from 46th Street to 84th Street in Manhattan. While it's mostly residential today, the island has a history of housing hospitals and asylums throughout the 19th and 20th century. In 1975, the smallpox hospital became a city landmark. However, no construction was done on it until years later. The city added reinforcement to the walls so that it wouldn't cave in, and they added lights around it so that it could be illuminated at night for nighttime visitors. In 1856, the infamous Renwick Smallpox Hospital opened its doors on the island's southernmost part. For 19 years, the hospital treated 7,000 smallpox patients a year, with about 750 deaths occurring there annually. By 1950, the hospital and its surrounding structures were abandoned, and the buildings deteriorated. While the smallpox hospital grounds still remain a popular tourist destination today, it is actually off limits to, for trespassing due to its unstable structure. What remains today are the spooky gothic ruins that stand hollow day and night. People have reported creepy encounters with spirits, leading some to dub this location as one of America's most haunted places. What do you think? Mr. Set, oh. hey. what? No, what, what are you talking about? Uh, he he needs you in his office. All right. I'm calling you. Oh, I'm tired. I'm tired of this. Well, I I think I'm making a good impression on everybody, but like everyone's just being mean to me. Am I allowed to eat on camera? Jonah, I said. Oh, Mr. Seth. Oh, hey, Natalie. How's it all coming along? It's going good. I have all the research. Reality TV has been around for decades. It's a genre of programming in which the everyday routines of real people's lives are closely documented by cameras. Reality TV's popularity has now increased with millions of people watching every day. Shows like Keeping Up with the Kardashians, The Real Housewives, Love and Hip Hop, Bad Girls Club, Toddlers and Tiaras, and way more reality TV shows made reality TV what it is today. Oh yeah, that sounds great. We should be set to film tomorrow. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks. Hey, Hi. How are you going? So I got the rest of the information that you asked for for the segment. Mm -hmm. And um, 
Okay, so I'd... Hey, um, I actually have some research of my own that I really wanted to tell you about. Um, so actually, American reality TV had its start in the game shows of the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And... Shows like Strike It Rich or Queen for a Day revolved around the discourse of need. People with tragic backstories would compete for prizes or money. Yeah, I kind of, I had that in my notes already. Just... Oh, oh, cool, 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 cool. The show Queen for a Day was about four female contestants who would compete for household appliances. They would describe how difficult their lives were, and then the audience would determine who would stay and who would go. Um, you know, if I have some time, I can help you out. With no, the it's, I, I got it. I, I got it. It's okay. Oh my God. Natalie. <laughs> she took my spotlight. I'm the new girl. Like, I need to impress Mr. Seth. <sighs> Whoa! Dude, you should totally take a picture in front of this. Oh, come on! <laughs> this picture came out good, though. Uh, I don't really know. It could have looked better. You can't lie, the picture came out good. Yeah, you're right. But she and I do enjoy the art that we find in our neighborhood. Today, we had the chance of finding the Global Angel Wings that was created by Colette Miller Spirit Pants in 2012. It's beautiful. Do you have any idea what it can mean? That I'm an angel? Uh, I don't really know about it. Uh, no. It's to remind me, you, and anyone else of humanity that we are the angels of this earth. Wow. That's deep. Yeah, kind of like that quote, don't judge a book by its cover, or is it by its name? I can't remember, but let's go with cover for now. We also got to see the Graffiti Hall of Fame. And I have to say that out of everything we saw, that's my favorite. Yeah, that was nice too. I read about it from the WNYC article and they spoke to director James Top. Top? Yes, Top. An interesting name for a very interesting person. Um, okay, what did he say? It all goes back to when he was young, and he and others would draw graffiti on abandoned buildings and such, due to them not really having art classes and supplies. It brought people together and they were able to teach each other some things or two. That's really cool, but you don't really see graffiti nowadays, and if you get caught doing it, I think you could get jail time or even a ticket. All depends, but nowadays, some people don't see graffiti as art, but as vandalism. Really? It's art to me! but try explaining that to the law enforcement because they think otherwise. And this stems from gentrification. Of course it does. Yeah. It says Jennifer Voidman Charaki. It looks like a memorial to somebody. Yeah, it reads beautiful, kind, loving, gracious. You will live in our hearts forever. Oh, That's so sweet. Wow. Actually, I read in the New York Times article that this woman named Karen May and like a bunch of other people had put a lot of quotes and like sayings on a bunch of flags and put them on benches in Central Park. Yeah, I've seen them around. That's like pretty cool. Yeah, so like, I think she wanted to share and many others wanted to share their feelings and thoughts and quotes and share with the people of New York City and Central Park. Yes. <laughs> That's awesome. This YC Weekly is going to be about tattoos, their history, and why some of us may or may not want them. Last August, my friends and I went on a trip to California, and while we were there, we wanted to get tattoos. It was spontaneous and thrilling, and I had already been wanting to get one for months. 
So I ended up getting the Jedi Order symbol because when I was younger, I always wanted to be a Jedi and I thought they were cool. However, I have to hide it from my parents because they can't stand tattoos. My mother is super religious and she even associates them with like criminals and something that's unholy. But where does this stigma come from? Let's take a look. The true origins of tattoos aren't certain, but there is definitely evidence that tattoos existed all over the world in different ancient civilizations. Throughout time, people have discovered mummified bodies with tattoos on them from places like ancient Egypt, China, and Russia. Despite the longevity of tattooing practices, these markings were looked down upon by many societies. In ancient Chinese literature, bandits were almost always described as having tattoos. And when European missionaries met native Polynesians, they heavily condemned their ritualistic tattoos. Meanwhile, in America, it wasn't until the late 1800s that tattoos began to be found on circus entertainers. A man called John O'Reilly had intricate tattoos all over his body and was labeled the Tattooed Irishman. Despite the intrigue around his tattoos, people would still describe them as being hideous or barbaric. Later on, throughout the 1920s and 1930s, tattoos would be found commonly among sailors. They used tattoos to symbolize their adventurous voyages. However, since most people with tattoos were still sailors, circus entertainers, or criminals, people still associated tattoos with negative connotations. In the 1930s, these negative thoughts only worsened when popular theories emerged that said that these tattoos were being done because of people's repressed sexual desires. Yeah. Moving on. When America entered World War II, the country experienced an intense patriotic wave. Men got military-inspired tattoos and other patriotic themes. And the new workforce of women also began to get tattoos. However, just like how one war brought forth an increase in patriotic tattoos, another one brought the downfall of them. The Vietnam War was criticized heavily by many Americans, and so nobody was really seeking to get any patriotic tattoos. And also, there was a lot of uncertainty about the safety of tattoos because people were connecting the spread of hepatitis with unclean needles. Later on in the 1980s and 1990s, as more musicians and celebrities were showing off their tattoos, more people began to desire tattoos and they became more socially acceptable. But around the 1990s, with the rise of digital communication, debates ensued over the ethics and cultural appropriation of certain tattoos, like the African and Polynesian tribal tattoos that were popular in the West. This debate continues to happen today. Some people think that tattoos have to have a significant meaning to them, while others think that you shouldn't be judged for what tattoo you get and you shouldn't be ridiculed or criticized. What do you guys think? So I got my tattoo just to get it over with pretty much. I had always been scared about inking up my skin out of fear of judgment from like my parents or my peers or whatever. But one day I just made the decision to go ahead and get it regardless of the repercussions. And yeah, it's been a year and I'm still happy with it. What about you, Jonah? Oh, um, I got my tattoo because I felt like um, I have a big purpose and I feel like everyone is, has a bigger purpose. So it's like mine represents that I have the universe in me and we all do and maybe we should all think like that. Um, Deja, don't you have something? I don't have any tattoos, plus I don't really care for them much. Moving on, I think that ultimately, if you get a tattoo and you're sure that it doesn't infringe on somebody else's culture, then it doesn't matter what tattoo you get, whether it's significant to you or not. I mean, who are we to judge, right? This has been your YC Weekly. I'm your host, Claudia Paguay. See you next time.